thrown away. So, you know, there's all kinds of different things. And I started looking at all these different areas because the risk rewards were so much better. So one of the things you know, they happen a lot, but there's not, you know, hundreds of things you can invest in all at once. So if you examine a situation, a special situation that something extraordinary is happening in a business and it's complicated or it's obscure or not everyone's looking at it for whatever reasons, because, you know, the regular analyst who follows that business doesn't really care about this little piece or whatever it might be you actually can almost not invest or even gamble. It's kind of like cheating where you know what something's worth, no one else is looking at it. And if you can buy it for a lot cheaper, it doesn't feel that risky to you. It's like, okay, I think it's worth 10 bucks and I can pay five. So if I'm wrong and it's only worth seven, you know, that's Ben Graham's margin of safety. I can buy a lot of that. And I think we talked about years ago, basically I didn't size my positions based on how much money I could make. I took bigger positions. You're able to take bigger positions and things you can't lose much money in. You know, if something's Yeah, I remember you telling me you put 40% of your assets roughly in one bet when there was the post merit split, the spin off. So you were incredibly bold when you really thought there was a massive margin of safety. Well, even in that one, I don't think I didn't feel that I was being bold. I felt like I had an opportunity that doesn't come along that often and I had to take advantage of it. And so in the host Marriott situation, which was a spinoff from Marriott, it split into two businesses. One was bad, which was called host Marriott, which owned a lot of real estate and debt. But the capital structure was set up so that there was a piece of the business that wasn't the debt was owned by a subsidiary. So the parent company, which was host Marriott, didn't really have effective debt on the company. They had assets that were asset specific, like a mortgage on a building or something, but they didn't have debt for the overall company. So actually I paid $4 for what I thought was $6 worth of assets that were unencumbered by debt. Plus there was a whole other business that was encumbered by debt, but it was in a subsidiary that could be worth a lot of money. So when I paid $4 for something that was debt free, a debt-free $6 plus a lot of other stuff, I didn't think I was taking a lot of risk. I thought that, wow, I just don't think people see this. This is super complicated and I better take advantage. And it's kind of like finding one of the best things you've ever seen, but putting one or 2% of your portfolio into it. That's not getting it right. That's getting it wrong. That's saying, I don't see this very often. And now I didn't really take advantage of it. So I made an extra half a percent or something like that. You know, you really have to take advantage of it. I don't know that 40% was the right number. It's true that I did that. I think I'm a little older, wiser, and seen much worse crazy things happen where I've actually made many mistakes. You know, I have a partner, Rob Goldstein, who joined me in 1989. And we've joked many times during our careers that. If we worked for someone else, they would have fired us like six times already. So you make mistakes. And so 40%, maybe I popped a number someplace and maybe I got the analysis wrong. That's true. But I did do that. You're right. You called me on that. And I'm not sure I would have done it that big, but still big. And so I got a Howard Marks. My favorite line from Howard Marks is always, experience is what you got when you didn't get what you wanted. Part of what you, I always thought you get paid for in this business is kind of your stomach that what I enjoyed about getting into the business was if you think well, and if you try to figure things out, it's not really a count how many hours you showed up thinking that it's the quality of your thought. And in this case, it doesn't matter how well you thought, other things still Mm -hmm. can happen. And understanding that, understanding that bad things can happen and preparing to survive to play another day is important. And so I think that was one of the best lessons. Of course, The market came back fairly quickly, so it wasn't, you know, as painful as it it could have been, but we didn't know that at the time. I mean, I remember watching Warren Buffett at his annual meeting right in the thick of things, maybe at the end of uh, March 2020. I think it was maybe April 1 or I I don't remember, not, not far after COVID started and he didn't look like this was nothing and it was a little frightening to see because it was really staring at the unknown. And if you're looking at the unknown, one of the benefits of working for a long time in this business is a lot of it is gaining experience, seeing a lot of things, contextualizing things, comparing things to what's happened in the past and what might happen. And this was fairly unique. So when you look back at those early years where you had, I think, probably 80% of your assets in six to eight positions, do you think in retrospect that you were maybe flying too close to the sun, that that was too risky and that to some degree you got lucky? Or would you still do it the same way? 
does that hyper concentrated approach still make tremendous sense to you, particularly now when markets have probably become more efficient? Maybe there are fewer opportunities, they're more picked over. Does super concentration still make sense or is it problematic because there are just such risks that you'll get blown out of the game? Because we focus on a handful of winners like you or Nick Sleep and Case Sicaria, these people who've had very concentrated portfolios. But I remember my friend Guy Spear mentioning a friend of his who had a one-stock portfolio and is now managing a cafe. There is a degree of survivor bias here. So I don't know, would you do it the same way again or was it too much risk? I don't consider six to eight names of making up 80% of your portfolio, particularly concentrated. One name for your whole portfolio, that's pretty concentrated. Once again, I pull out and I'm just going to be spitballing that I'm close here is that when Warren Buffett said, let's say you sell your business and you get a million dollars and then you look around town at a couple hundred businesses and picking six or eight that you can buy at a good price that are in good businesses with management that you think is going to do a good job and you did your homework. And then you divided that million dollars into six or eight businesses that you thought were the best and best price with good futures in town and well-managed. No one would say you're crazy because you're thinking of them as businesses. You divided your investment into businesses. If you think of them as stocks and pieces of paper that bounce around that you're going to get quotes on every day, and there's going to be some volatility involved as opposed to taking a three or five-year horizon in owning those six or eight different businesses, as a businessman, no one would think you're crazy. They'd think you're pretty prudent. You know, you took that million dollar windfall from your business and divided it in six or eight places. They'd say, hey, you're a conservative guy, but put a stock price on it every day. People change the analysis. You know, if you read finance literature, it's myopic loss aversion. You know, in other words, people don't like losing, at least getting a quote 30 to 40% down, you know, and it's very big institutions invest in private equity, you know, and those are funds that invest in a small handful of businesses and they leverage them up. And no one thinks they're crazy. You know, what they do is they just don't mark down their portfolios the way the stock market does. They wait a few months, see what's going on, and pick a number that everyone's in on it. The person who bought it doesn't want to get their portfolio marked down. And the person who's the manager doesn't want to mark down their portfolio. So I think it's kind of smooths the ride, even though they're buying leverage equity stubs in very concentrated portfolio. And everyone thinks those guys are basically geniuses and they make a lot of money. So I don't see it any different. I just get a quote every day and I got to contextualize that in the right way. I forgot why I had an opportunity to talk to him, but either we were taking a walk someplace or whatever. And I was saying, you know, I was so upset that I lost money in this thing and how unfair it was. And this thing came out of the blue. And this gentleman turned to me and he says, well, have you ever made money where, you know, you were kind of lucky and, you know, it turned out better than you expected. And I said, yeah, that happens a lot. He said, well, does it happen more than when the bad things happen? I said, yeah. And he said, well, stop complaining. And, you know, it's a good way to contextualize. You know, if you didn't take risk, you couldn't make extra money. You can put your money in the bank and only take inflation risk or whatever that might be, but at least you know what you have. But one of the reasons you're able to make money is that the stock market gets very emotional sometimes, creates these opportunities, but it also comes along with pain. If it didn't, everyone would do it and you wouldn't have this opportunity. And of course, I'm saying something now, not in the heat of the moment, that sounds very logical. And But eventually you get there. Eventually when bad things happen in a few days, if you can get your sea legs back and start thinking, okay, where are my opportunities? What can I do? Can I trade around in my portfolio? Is there a new opportunity that came up that's maybe better than what I have? And that's been the case. So I think good investors maybe still get kicked in the stomach, but then come back soon enough to take advantage of the opportunities that come there. I think big, big picture, you have to have a little bit of a screw list to take the pain, especially with a very concentrated portfolio that a number of people I know pursue. I did it for a number of reasons. I don't, when I'm looking for really what I would call unfair bets, I don't have 50 or 100 unfair bets at a time to take. So by necessity, I have to when I was running a very concentrated portfolio, take six or eight of them and just have a very fine, I think you have to have a very high hurdle, meaning, well, to get into the portfolio, it has to be really great. And if you own six or eight great things, or at least great bets, that's more comforting if you actually know what you own. If you don't know what you own, if you don't know how to value a business, you're just going to react to the emotions because you don't actually understand what you own. But if you actually understand what you own and the premise that you bought those things with is still intact, 
That's actually the only way I think you can deal with the emotion because you realize it's what you own is still good.